to the University of Maastricht program on the reform of international investment law. So far we discussed international investment law, in particular a number of bilateral treaties and multilateral treaties encapsulating ISDS. ISDS is a unique adjudication mechanism in international law granting investors the right to sue states, sovereign states, in forum other than that domestic court. ISDS has been criticized for its high damage award, its investors bias, its lengthy procedures and the cost incurred by both states and investors. I have the pleasure to invite today Ivan Adamianovich, who is an expert in investment law, and we shall discuss uh, some of the features of ISDS and to understand why uh, ISDS is subject to so many controversies. How does ISDS differ from disputes in international law? So usually in international law we have disputes between states, so a state against a state. And the dispute settlement mechanism can be either negotiation or mediation, conciliation, arbitration or an international court. Here we have a dispute between a private party, a foreign investor, and the state in which that investor has invested. And the mechanism of that dispute settlement is arbitration. It seems to me that the offer to arbitration is the cornerstone of the system. Has the respondent state any possibility to withdraw its consent? Yes, yeah, so the offer to arbitrate is given in an international investment agreement and it's given to any number of investors. Investors accept that offer by initiating arbitral proceedings. So once that happens, the states cannot withdraw their consent. It means that the states are really on the defensive. States are on the defensive side because these international agreements and the offer to arbitrate is given to investors. It's not meant for states to sue investors. You know, proponents of ISDS argue that without it, state courts are likely to discriminate against foreign investors. Please sit down. And I was wondering whether this uh, does not reflect a deep mistrust in the independence and impartiality of domestic courts. Investment treaty arbitration was created with an idea to have a neutral forum for the settlement of disputes between foreign investors and states. So on the one hand, this neutral forum would take away these disputes from political relations between the investor's home state and the investor's host state. But on the other hand, it would also give an extra layer of independence for foreign investors. So in other words, ISDS is really an attempt to bypass, to circumvent domestic courts. And you just mentioned politics. Uh, the first thing we're teaching our students is that there is a, a dividing line between politics on the one hand and the role played by domestic courts. How do you react to, the, to this criticism? So domestic courts, we assume, are independent, but what investment treaty arbitration gives to foreign investors is also certain autonomy, which they otherwise would not have before domestic courts. So you can look at investment treaty arbitration also as an alternative disputes resolution mechanism, which is suitable, it could be suitable for disputes which involve the state in its role, in its commercial. But this is giving rise to another legal issues, is the reverse discrimination on the account that domestic investor, in investors cannot avail themselves of the same rights than the right to sue the state that has been granted to foreign investors. Indeed, that is one of the criticism of uh, ISDS. So why would you give foreign investors more rights than you give to domestic investors, especially in 
uh, states which have developed legal systems. Bluntly speaking, it makes sense to protect investors investing in flawed states on the account that they are taking significant risk. Does it make sense to um, provide ISDS proceedings in states that do abide by the rule of law? Well, investment treaty arbitration becomes an extra tool in the investor's toolbox, an alternative dispute resolution mechanism that they can use instead of domestic proceedings. I see, I see. Uh, in case the investor lose its case before the tribunal, um, has he or she the possibility to initiate proceedings before domestic courts? So this would usually depend on the investment treaty in question. So you would need to look at whether such a possibility is given in a treaty. In many treaties, you can have so-called parallel proceedings. So you could have proceedings before the domestic court as well as before arbitral tribunals. So it means that the investors uh, can be op opportunistic and choose the, the best judicial means to contend with uh, state measures? Well, this is what we would call a forum shopping and it has been addressed in newer treaties. So in a number of treaties now, you um, have provisions which would ban such parallel proceedings. So the investors should choose whether they want to have proceedings before domestic courts or before uh, an international tribunal. For example, we have such uh, provisions in C. Uh, the independence and impartiality of domestic courts. I've been skimming the literature on ISDS and many authors um, criticize the systems on the account that it gives rise to phenomenon called revolving, revolving door policy uh, or double hatting. Do you agree with these critics? Well, there are indeed studies that demonstrate that this has been practiced in international uh, investment law and treaty arbitration uh, in particular and this is one of the core aspects that the reform of ISDS is looking to address. So you, you do have situations where you have same people acting as arbitrators uh, and then as counsels and as expert witnesses. Um, so if you compare the criteria of independence and impartiality that are imposed on domestic courts and the criteria imposed in investment arbitration, there are certainly much stricter cr criteria imposed on domestic courts. If I understand correctly, a magistrate uh, cannot uh, move uh, to a law firm and uh, uh, come back to, to the court system, whereas uh, an attorney in court advising an investor uh, is likely to be appointed as an uh, arbitrator and so that's the, the key difference. Well that's part of the so-called party autonomy. So parties, whether investors or states, have right a possibility to choose their own arbitrators, councils, expert witnesses and usually they will choose those people that actually have experience in the field. So there's a striking difference with domestic courts. In case the respondent state loses its case before the tribunal, can the state challenge the award? Well, the awards can be challenged only on very limited and procedural grounds, so there is no merits review. And this challenge also depends on the uh, proced procedural rules under which the arbitration uh, took place. So if we're talking about exit arbitration, we could say that this is a self-enforcement um, system, so there is no control of domestic courts whatsoever. The awards are final and binding. If we're talking about arbitrations that uh, have taken place under 
UNCITRAL rules, there will be uh, recognition of these awards and then they can be challenged, as I said, on very limited grounds before domestic courts in the country of the seat where the arbitration took place. What a striking difference with a national judicial system where a judgment handed down by a tribunal of first of instance can be challenged before a court of appeal. Yeah, we don't have a court of appeal in investment treaty arbitration. There is no review on merits. This is part of the discussions, but so far there are no such possibilities. Given that there is no appellate mechanism, how can one ensure the consistency between these different awards? Is there not a risk of discrepancies between these different awards, in other words? Indeed, that has been a problem and it's one of the core concerns of the reform of ISDS that is taking place in the UNCITRAL. So the problem is that you have a number of tribunals, ad hoc tribunals, and their awards are sometimes not only inconsistent but contradictory. So that is creating problems for the states as well as investors in terms of predictability. You have been stressing that this investment treaty is enshrined a uh, rather broadly framed rights. Is there not a risk that the tribunals interpret these rights, these vague framed rights, uh, rather broadly and become therefore rule makers? Well, first and foremost, tribunals are dispute resolution bodies. So they're there to resolve disputes between foreign investors and states, and their decisions are very fact specific. Nevertheless, subsequent tribunals do refer to previous decisions and they do refer to rules that were made in those decisions. So although we don't have a system of precedent in international law, de facto there these decision making works on the basis of precedent. Are you taking the view that states have been delegating their powers to these tribunals? Of course, that has been unintentional. States did not envisage that tribunals would be actually effectively making rules. But nevertheless, that has been the case. So what the states are now doing is trying to take the control back, if you like, and in the new generation of investment agreements, providing for more specific rules. <laughs> It seems to me that states have always the possibility to issue binding interpretation. Are they taking advantage of that opportunity? Yes, there is such opportunity. Of course, in international law, there is always such opportunity. But these binding interpretations are not that often as we might think. So, for example, there have been instances in the context of NAFTA, but the, the effects of these binding interpretations were also quite limited. You have been stressing uh, that the system has been quite uh, influenced by private commercial practice. However, um, the state measures are at stake, uh, be it subsidies, uh, be it land planning requirements, labor requirements. So is there a ways in which tribunals in applying this private practice interfere with a genuine state regulations. So the main challenge of international investment law is combining its public-private character. So on the one hand we're talking about public international law as the basis of international investment law and on the other hand we're talking about dispute settlement mechanism which is more suitable for commercial law, private law. And that dispute settlement mechanism, as you pointed out, does undermine the state's right to regulate. Thank you very much indeed, Ivan Adamianovich. It was a pleasure to discuss with you these controversial issues. 
Thank you, Nicola, for inviting me. It was a pleasure to discuss in such a beautiful setting. A bientôt. A bientôt.